But when it comes to the question, why Christmas, right, when it comes to that question, why Christmas, I just immediately kind of go through some traditions, and, uh, and I'll throw up a few traditions that we're going to walk through today. You know, Christmas itself, the word, all right, now, th- a lot of people don't really know where that comes from. We get really mad when people cha- you know, take it off our red cups and all that kind of fun stuff. So I understand, but the word Christmas itself, um, which does mean Christ mass, that's really kind of the original uh, writing of it in 1038, I don't even know how to say that, 1038, is that the best way to say that, 1038? I wasn't around. It's an old English phrase, um, and it's also been known, obviously, as midwinter, uh, you know, part of the winter solstice uh, time frame as well. Yule is the season. Think of Yule tide, you know, joy or whatever the case is. Um, it's also known as nativity time. And so different cultures, kind of depending on where, you, you know, at the time of history that you, you find yourself in. Christmas wasn't always the word used, but it did find its origin eventually uh, in terms of, uh, of what it meant. And then, uh, you know, we got the Christmas tree, which is really fun. Because a lot of people talk about how this is this pagan thing and Christians love it and all that kind of thing. And it's true, but people don't really understand that everything in our, in our world is origin is pagan. <laughs> you know, so everything doesn't understand the fact that, that people who don't understand you know, anything about Christianity, they do understand what it's like to have spirits and evil and, you know, struggles and things. They just attributed it wrong. You know, they, they talked about gods. You know, all of Greek mythology is actually rooted in some sort of truth in terms of how it is that they want to try to explain life. And so even the Christmas tree, which was fun, evergreens, as they are known, uh, have always kind of held this place as something that was good luck for you. Things that were green all year long, which nobody understood as farmer, you know, farmers. Things that were green all year long, that was a good thing, right? So they would oftentimes put it in their house. It would be something good. There was a lot of sun worship involved, and some, some uh, religions or some you know, parts of history believe that, well, the sun god was weak, and this was why the winter solstice a time when there wasn't enough sun, you know, it was dark most of the time, and so they would put these evergreens in their home, and they would, there would be some worship aspect to it, and so there's some of this. Now, it's said that in the 16th century, uh, German Christians were some of the first ones sort of attributed to, you know, decorating the tree, and they oftentimes did that with candles, right? And, and we know how well fire goes with dead trees, especially Christmas trees. So I am positive that they fixed that fairly quickly, right? But that's how it started, right, in terms of decorating the tree in the house. It was Christians, actually, uh, who uh, kind of attributed that. But did you know that the Christmas tree itself, it was rejected well into the 1800s by Americans. Well into the 1800s, Americans still rejected it as something pagan, as something that did not belong with Christmas, that did not belong as a part of our culture, and then slowly became something. Now, obviously, now, I mean, I can't even imagine Christmas without a Christmas tree, Right? It's part of our traditions. Uh, Advent, candles, you know, the wreath, that is actually Christian, completely Christian tradition in terms of the wreath and the lighting of the candles and four weeks before Christmas and reading some scripture now and you can kind of, it's a whole idea of anticipation, that's what Advent means. Um, And then of course we have the spirit of Christmas, which I really thought was hilarious, that we, we use this term a lot. In terms of even, even anywhere in our culture, not to be a Christian, but it's like the spirit of Christmas is this idea that people are just friendlier, right? They're just nicer. Like watch any Scrooge movie, right? It's all about the spirit of Christmas. It's, it's this idea that you're nicer, you're more generous, you're, you care about others, you do things for other people. And, and, and the actual phrase origination in terms of the spirit of Christmas was completely different. Um, when it came to like people gathering, Right, you know, getting in their homes and having celebrations and dinners and so on and so on. It had nothing to do with the fact that it was warm and cheery on the inside. It had everything to do with what they believed, how dangerous and vulnerable they were on the outside. Right, in the winter solstice, they believed again spiritually there was the spiritual realm where that was it was just being torn at the winter solstice that there was a spiritual invasion, you know, of, of, of evil and ghosts and things that would come in and take you know take their victims and kind of wreak havoc. And so they would. They would gather together inside in loud merriment and celebration. Why? To try to convince evil spirits that there was too many humans gathered in one place to come take on. So they were trying to get the spirits of Christmas away. And it's funny how that phrase is going to completely change in terms of how we view the spirit of Christmas. So we'll save some other traditions for the next few weeks. Uh, when you ask why Christmas, it is fun to kind of go back and go, well, why do we do that? Why do we do presents and stockings and St. Nicholas and all these things? It's interesting to look at. We're asking why Christmas, obviously, from the standpoint of why, why in terms of faith, why in terms of if you call yourself a believer and a follower of Christ, why is it that Christmas means something different to you? Like, what is it that we really believe, and this is true, something true, why we believe that something changed in the fabric of time, in the fabric of history, something changed. 
Really, everything changed in one moment. And, and that's this idea of hope. This is really where we kind of come from. Uh, the, one of the favorite scriptures I love to read at Christmas time is from John 1. And so I want to put up John 1 just to read a, a few verses. As John starts off his gospel by just kind of highlighting, you know, this, this beautiful word picture that the word, capital W, speaking obviously in terms of Christ, gave life to everything that was created. And his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Keep going down to jump down to verse 10. He said he, talking about Christ, came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. I love that passage because... It really talks about this idea. You know, there, there is evil in the world. There, you, know, they, you know, again, the roots of what we, of even pagan religion, have a, has a stem of truth in it. There's evil, there's darkness, and light was needed. Hope was needed. A lot of Christian, modern Christian song, or Christian kind of Christian music says, you know, hope was born on Christmas Day. This beautiful picture that there was hope that came. This expectation that there was more, that there was something better. Hope came at Christmas, and everything changed from that point forward. And there's John talking about this light that came. The darkness can't extinguish it. You know, and there's this beautiful picture that even though he came and he received rejection, anyone who believed in him, anyone who, who followed him, they now had this, 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 this beautiful thing to be called the children of God, to be called the child of God. It is the hope that we have. This absolute hope that we talk about as a church is really ended and rooted and founded in this idea of, being reconnected with our creator, being reconnected with God, is that absolute hope. And that is what was offered to us at Christmas time. That's what happened through this season. So when we ask why Christmas, we are really kind of diving into why did everything change and what was so significant about that hope that was, that was born? What was so significant about that hope that was given to us? And so today, as we kind of uh, focus on a per particular passage I want us to just look at the idea that Christ himself, uh, I have a phrase that I, I, I've heard years ago. I don't, I don't even know who said it anymore. I wish I would have wrote it down. Uh, and then I've heard other people say it, so it's kind of hard to give you know, uh, credit to them. But it's really helpful for me when I read the Gospels. And, and it's this phrase right here. It says, if you want to know what Jesus meant by what he said, or when he said blank, right? If you want to know about what Jesus said when he said blank, and put in there whatever you want. Okay, you know, love your neighbors yourself. I mean, put whatever, anything in there that was written in red, any of your Bibles that still got red in it, anything that he said. If you want to know what he meant when he said blank, look at the way he lived. Look at what Jesus did. Look at, this is, this is his life's example. And so when I looked at this in terms of just this idea, Jesus would live his life with a significant focus in bringing hope to helpless people. He would, he would live his life with a significant focus on bringing hope to the poor and the weak and the, uh, the lonely and the marginalized, the harassed, the depressed, the ashamed, the isolated, the insecure, those simply struggling with what life has stacked against them. And I want you to understand, I use the word poor as well, but people who are helpless doesn't mean that they are financially poor. Okay, understand, I, when I'm saying, I'm, I'm saying poor, I'm saying poor in spirit, as he would talk about in the Beatitudes. I'm saying poor from the standpoint of you're stuck in a system of life and you feel like there is nothing else, therefore you have no hope, therefore you are hopeless and helpless in that cycle. There are many, many people I know who have many, many means. And they are just as helpless as other people that I've met because of how they feel. So there's an aspect of this that, that Jesus would spend a majority of his time, even the rich young ruler who would come to Christ, Christ would minister to him as someone who is helpless. He would pour out his focus on those alone, marginalized, hurting, uh, you know, physically uh, crippled, you know, just diseased. He would spend all of this time as he lived out his life. So when Jesus would say things concerning our love for our neighbor and our ability to minister to those and bring hope to those, he was actually speaking very specifically in terms of how he lived as to who he was bringing hope to, who he was kind of focused on. I, I want to go to a, a, a part of a story. This is kind of the main, uh, main scripture I want to read today. But it's in Matthew 9, and it's a time where Jesus is already doing ministry. He's well into his years of ministry. 
he comes actually up, and this is by the sea, and this particular picture is by the sea. He comes up, and he's kind of on a hilltop. He's been in the city. He's been in, uh, you know, kind of teaching in synagogues, and it goes on to say he's been teaching in synagogues, and he's been doing all these things. And then he comes on the scene of more people, and that's oftentimes where people were, the fishermen and things were coming uh, to see him. And so here's what he said. He said, Jesus went through all the towns, this is Matthew's recount, and the village. He was teaching the synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. And it says, when he saw the crowds, he had what? What's the word? Yeah, you can read out loud. I'll say it one more time. When he saw the crowds, he had what? Compassion, Compassion on them because they were what? Harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send more workers, or send out workers into the harvest field. Now this this verse is oftentimes, you know, quilted on pillows and put over top of mission, you know, organizations. And, and it's used a lot in terms of strictly the idea of evangelism. This idea that Jesus saw all the lost people and therefore he needed to show them and talk to them about how he was the good news, that he was the savior. And that's for, therefore what we're called to do because the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. And it's not that I don't think that that's true, but it cannot be all of it because that's not all that Jesus did. Right? If we want to know what he meant by what he said, we have to look at the way Jesus lived. And he would live his life not walking into every single person sharing the fact that, you know what, you need to believe in me or you're going to go to hell. Matter of fact, he hardly ever said that. He went to people and he healed diseases, he healed sickness, he ministered to them, he gave of his time, he gave of his resources, he gave of his energy, he gave time of his disciples. He would minister and minister and minister and pour out his compassion onto the helpless. I love those words when it says he had compassion on them because they were helpless and harassed. Helpless in the terms of what people could see, harassed by what Jesus only could see. Harassed by the evil one, harassed by the enemy, harassed in their own souls and hearts and minds. He said, I see them and there's compassion that rises up. Why? Here's why. Compassion itself resides in people who believe that there is hope. Okay, compassion resides, it lives in people who believe that there's more. Okay, not from a selfish term of goals. I'm talking about believe there's more. Believing that there's no one too far out of reach. There is no one so far gone. There is no one that is unhelpable. There is no one and nothing in terms of circumstances that cannot be overcome. Obviously, this is where Christ lives. He lives in a place of going, I'm the Savior. I know that there's hope. I know that it exists. I know that there's more for you. There's more for your mind, soul, and spirit. I know this for you. But it also resides in us. For those who believe that there is hope, for those who believe there is more to this life, you will find those people who have the ability to have compassion. If you've ever noticed anybody who's sort of given up on life, you will not find compassion in them. They do not have the ability to have compassion in them because they, don't, they themselves don't believe that there's anything more. They themselves have lost sight of hope. They themselves are now helpless and stuck. But really, compassion, compassion itself, where Jesus shows us by example, compassion it resides in those who believe, who have faith that there is hope. And then here's what happens. Compassion for you and I, compassion is the fuel that produces gratitude and generosity. Now, I want to share why these two things are, are big deals in terms of how Christ lives but uh, in his life and how he gave an example for us. But I help you understand this gratitude part because I think sometimes people make it sound like when you see someone in need, if there's even a moment of time where you feel grateful that you're not in, that, in those person's shoes, that is always considered negative. That is always considered selfish. And here's the problem with that. The problem with that is, number one, that's a very natural thing for you to feel. If it's completely natural for you to look at a situation and go, I'm, I'm thankful that I'm not living in Africa and Kenya right now. Right? I'm, not, I'm thankful that I was born here. I'm thankful that I was born in this time. I'm thankful for all those things. It is not a selfish gratitude. Now, there is a selfish gratitude. I'll talk about that in a minute. But there is an aspect of this that compassion in you, when you believe that there's hope, compassion actually draws in you a authentic gratitude, a gratitude in which you in your mind begin to go, I am so thankful, God, for the opportunities you've given me. 
I'm so thankful, God, for the way you've blessed me. I'm so thankful, God, for how you've blessed my family. I am so thankful. I'm so thankful for you. And you're the hope of my life. That is not selfish gratitude. Why? Because that gratitude in turn also produces generosity. It's the voice in your head that immediately when you have that compassion, real compassion, and you have the gratitude thought, the next thought in you is how can I help? What can I do? How can I be a part of the solution? How can, I, how can I leverage what I've been blessed with? How can I take my time and my resources? How can I now use what's been given to me to somehow solve this? Somehow help, somehow meet some need, even if it's small. It's that voice. It's those things that are, come to us that says, how can I help? How can I be there? This friend has such a need. How can I drive them to that thing? How can I, how can I meet that person with this little small thing that would just give them some ray of hope. That's what compassion does. In concert together, it will produce gratitude. I'm just telling you. Don't feel bad about that. Don't feel bad about the, the fact that the authentic gratitude will come into you. when you get, Listen, the best way to experience this is going on one of, our go, uh, one of our global outreach trips. You go to Kenya, you go to Peru, you go to even West Virginia. I'm telling you, you don't have to spend more than 24 hours with the people who live there. There will be parts of you that will have to fight that, that tension of thinking that it's negative, but there will be parts of you that immediately go, God, I am thankful for what you have given me. I am thankful for it all. But in concert, it will produce in you, if it really is compassion, it will produce in you a spirit of generosity to say, how can I help? How, what can I do while I'm here? What can I, how can I be a part of this? How can, how can I help bring hope to this situation, this person, this moment? Now, Kind of going on the flip side, if you are not moved by compassion, oftentimes it's because we're stuck in judgment. And, and judgment, albeit most of the time silent, prevents our heart from moving to the place that it needs to move to, to moving to a place of compassion. When we are not filled with compassion, when it's, not, when it's not a moment like Jesus on the hill looking at these people and seeing that they are helpless and harassed, then oftentimes, oftentimes, it's because we're stuck in judgment. There's a silent voice in our soul when the person comes to us and wants money and they solicit us for something that tells us they are not going to use that for gas or food. They are scamming me in some way. They are taking advantage of this moment. There is something in us that immediately moves to judgment and says, no, the need is probably not real. Christians do it best. Okay, Christians do it best because we basically say, well, the Lord will take care of you. Right? Or even worse, Christians go, you know, the Bible says if you don't work, you don't eat. You know, the Bible does say that, right? Sorry, I just want to help you. Know yeah, the Bible says if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. And therefore, you look at someone and go, well, you look like you could work. You look like you could work. And again, this is not always verbal. This is just something internal. This is something that, that blocks that compassion from happening because we're stuck in judgment. We're stuck in a very selfish zone. And, and, the, and the thought process that might come to mind is, well, I'm really glad I'm not in their shoes. And that is not authentic gratitude. Well, I'm, really not, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really glad I'm not in that marriage. I'm really, not, I'm really glad I'm not in that family. I'm really glad I'm not stuck in that thing. I'm really glad I'm not jobless right now like that person seems to be. And yet what's so sad is that the need is often, and I'm again, I, I want you to hear me. I know there's people who scam. I know there's people who take advantage. I know that that exists. What I also know is that the need exists in a much larger sense. You and I, listen, most of us are only one or two or three tragedies away from being homeless, poor, and starving. Seriously. You are only two or three things away from that being your story. God did not promise your house would not be repossessed. God did not promise that you would have food on the table all the time. So we're, we have to have a place that gets us out of that stuck place of judgment. Now here's why I say most of the time. Because often when judgment is not there, but compassion is not there either, it's because we're sitting in a place of apathy. 
And listen, apathy, this is the best way I can describe it. Apathy in us is the inability to care or have concern about anything or anyone outside of yourself. That's what apathy is. Apathy is this place where I don't even have it in me. I have no emotions in me. I have nothing in me to have care or concern about your helplessness. Let's just be honest. It's usually because we are so consumed and preoccupied with what's going on with us. We are so consumed and preoccupied about our needs and our wants and our lives and our struggles and our own feelings sometimes of helplessness that a real need could be right in front of us and we see nothing and we feel nothing. It's not because of judgment, but it's certainly not compassion. It's just a place of apathy. And yet Jesus looks over and says, With compassion in his heart, man, the harvest, the need, the helpless are plentiful. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send more workers, more ministers of hope, more ambassadors for me. Send more into that field of helplessness. Now, for you and me, this can only happen by compassion. This can only happen by compassion. And yet, here's, here, I just want you to share with you, when I was doing this study a few weeks ago, a question kept coming to mind, and I want you to understand, when God usually brings a question to mind, I don't like it, so I don't, I don't ever write it down. And then he brings it to mind again, and he brings it to mind again, and he brings it to mind at nauseam, and finally I finally go, okay, okay, I'll try to find the answer to that question. Here's the question. Is bringing... Hope to the helpless, optional. You understand a reason. Optional is safe. Optional, somewhat in my mind, gives me a picture that I can try something or test waters or dip my foot in there and see if it works for me and see if it's part of this. I mean, I know the way Jesus lived and I know what he said, but the question is, is that required of me or is it optional? Well, here's the problem with that. And as I was studying and as I was looking, another one of Jesus' moments, another one of his parables actually, just kept coming up in my study and I couldn't ignore it. It actually is in Matthew 25 and it starts off in verse, uh, I'll give it to you in verse uh, 31, but I'll kind of set it up first. In verse 31 it says that he, he begins to give a parable and just to clarify for you, Jesus would oftentimes teach in parables or give parables Because it was a way of taking the complexity of God or the complexity of the kingdom and breaking it down into pictures and word pictures and illustrations so that people would understand it. Does that make sense? That's that, that's, I just want you to understand, that's the point of a parable. It's not, it's not to try to take word for word things and go, well, that's it. It's the point of a spirit of a parable is to say, look, there is some, there's something very complex I want you to understand. So I'm going to give you some, I'm going to give you a picture of it, an illustration. And he goes on to talk about this time of judgment, this time of final thing where the king is going to be ruling over all and he's going to be on his throne and all nations will be at his feet. And then he goes on to say, and he will at that point separate sheep from goats. And this would, again, would be a picture that they would all understand because this would happen in many of their understanding. You've got to separate the sheep from the goats. And he said that he would separate the sheep to the right and he would put the goats to the left. And so they're tracking with him already because they're like, I get it. I understand those pictures. But here's what he says. He says, the king will say to those on his right, come who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you for the creation, from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous ones, these are the ones he's speaking to, on the right will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? Or a stranger and show you hospitality? Or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Now there's a big emphasis here, huge emphasis 
on, on this time of judgment, on this time where the king is going to reference everyone at one time. And he's going to say to them these words. Now, here's what's hard. When you, if you were to go to any, you know, Western, modern Christian and say, listen, when you stand before God one day, what do you honestly think he's going to say to you? What do you honestly believe he's going to hold you in account for? Most people would say, well, you know, I was a kid. I, I prayed the prayer, you know, or um, I got baptized. Uh, I put, you know, all these other words. I put my faith in Christ. I mean, he's, he's my Lord and my salvation. Um, uh, I, I believed that. I believed that he was the son of God. And they'll kind of go down two or three beliefs, and then they'll kind of go down some things that they did but the, do, the doing things are going to be things like, well, I went to church, uh, I mean, as often as I could, and, uh, you, know, I gave, uh, you know, I gave a tip on the way out sometimes in the box about every other seventh time I came to church. So I did that, you know, I, 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 I tried to be nice, I tried not to swear as much as I wanted to, you know, or I said in my head, you know, it's all these things. We would probably list out several things, and somewhere towards the end or, you know, middle of the end, we probably would have something in there about, you know, loving other people and trying not to judge. And we'd probably say a few things like this. But when you look at this list, this list is really, really focused on what he's going to ask. You know, you, you, you were sick. You know, you did this. You, you comforted me when I was sick. You visited me when I wasn't well. You, you gave me clothing. You gave me drink. You gave me, and these are all physical needs. These are all physical, emotional needs. He says, you did all these things. Why? Well, when you did it to the least of these, when you did it to those who were helpless, you did it to me. And that's awesome. I love this scripture. I loved it. I just ended it. I didn't want to read anymore. Problem is it goes on. Here we go. The king will turn to those on the left and say, away with you. You cursed ones, the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. And they will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? He said, the answer is, I tell you the truth, when you, what's the word? When you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you refuse to help me. I, I want you to hear this from a heart that, 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 is not, that is not motivated by fear or guilt. There are no shoulds in my language here, okay? Just understand, there's no shoulds and oughts here. I just want you to see that when Jesus decided to take the complexity of something like a final judgment, the complexity of things, he did it several times. He decides in this moment to talk about the focus of his attention, the focus of how he lived, and he decides when he separates the sheets from the goats, this is what's going to be asked in this story. And here's going to be the outcome for those who do and for those who do not. Which leads me to the conclusion, when I asked that question, it led me to the conclusion that bringing hope to others we're accountable. Now, this is, I just want to clarify. If you call yourself a follower of Christ, you believe that Christ came for you at Christmas. This is the story of hope. Christmas is a story of hope for you. He came for you. He bled and died for you to pay your debt. He rose on the third day to give you freedom. I just want you to hear these words. We're accountable. We're accountable to bring hope this hope that we talk about to others, especially to the helpless and those in distress and those in need. It is not optional. It is not safe. But it can only be, listen, it can only be fueled by compassion. Okay, understand, fear cannot make you give your life away. Fear and guilt and shame cannot make you live a life where you are truly grateful and you are truly generous and you give your life away and you serve others and you place others ahead of yourself. It cannot happen. This is truly the argument right now for the refugees. 
all the shoulds and the shouldn't we, and aren't we Christian, and shouldn't this happen, and we ought to do something. Listen, all of those words from a place of shame or guilt or another motivation, they are not filled with brokenness. Tell all those people on Facebook to shut up. You sense the heart of someone that's actually broken for them? You say, let's go do something about it. Let's give money right now. You and me. How much you got? Because if you are filled with compassion, if you are actually broken over the plight of millions who are homeless, you will do something about it. That is what you will do. You will be generous and you will have gratitude in the midst of doing it. You will not be moved by fear. You will not be moved by guilt. It doesn't matter what someone else says because you already are moved by compassion. Every other argument, every other conversation is worthless. Every other motivation is temporary. But when we are moved with compassion, just as Jesus was, just as he lived his life an example for us, we will thank God for how he's blessed us. And we will give of our time and our resources and anything that we have that we've been given and blessed with. We will pour it out. Compassion is power when it comes to pointing the helpless to the hope that is in Christ. Powerful. And we as a church, we have this phrase, right? You've heard it before. We exist. <laughs> it's our mission. We exist to humbly point everyone to absolute hope. It's, it's, it's on the wall. It's not just art. It is our heartbeat as a gathering, not as an institution, not as a leadership board, but as a gathering of churches, of, of, of people in our church. That we want to point people to this hope. We want this time. And there's no better time than Christmas time. There's no better time than this season, these holidays from Thanksgiving through Christmas to the new year for us to be the banner, the anthem that tells people about the hope of Christ. It's, it's why we were given that hope to begin with. Now, last night I had an opportunity at the Hope for the Holidays event in Burkdale where a gentleman who knew that, well, I had done the um, interview and he, he wasn't connected to Journey, but he asked and he said, I hear, are you with Journey Church? Are you the pastor of Journey? I said, yes. And he said, well, I heard you talking about Hope Like Norman. Do you lead Hope Like Norman? And I said, yes. And he said, well, how does that work? And I tried to explain to him, you know, in a very brief way, you know, Hope Lake Norman is our nonprofit. It's our community development nonprofit that we want to invest in to, to work with other nonprofits and do this. And he finally got around to asking the question. He says, well, let me ask you a question. He says, the reason I'm asking is because I don't really, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense why a nonprofit like yours would try to raise money for other nonprofits. And I said, well, we're part of the raising, you know, Hope Lake Norman is a part of this. I said, it's not like we're, we, 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 we're part of these uh, nonprofits. I mean, some of the money will go towards things that we want to do next year for Hope Like Norman. I said, it's not, it's not completely there. And he said, yeah, but why would you, why would you even? He's like, I, he said, I've been to so many fundraisers for different nonprofits. It's all about what they're doing and their thing and their thing. And I just basically said in a very, very simple way, listen, the reason we're doing it is because uh, we can. And so we should. That's all I said. Listen, we, we can. And I, I couldn't tell him everything, but you know, in my heart, I thought about the last, you know, 12 years as a church, 13 years as a church. Gosh, I don't even know how old our church is anymore. And just even the last four years, and I began to look at how much God has blessed us as a church. What he's done, the people he's brought, the, the everything. And when I say everything, I mean everything how he has just shown favor to this little C church. I am filled with gratitude. But at the same time, it's not about us, and, it, and he didn't bless us for us. It's not so Journey can be a great church. It's not so that we can make our name great. It's not so that people can know who we are. It's so people can know who he is, right? Right? We can do it. There were times in our life as a church we couldn't do anything, and now we can. So we should, right? Now we should. It's our responsibility. We're accountable for it. 
We want to pour ourselves out, give ourselves away, give it to them. We want to see them meet needs. We want to be a part of what they're doing. We want to do more of those events across our city and across our community. Why? Because there are people just like you and me who are pouring out their lives with compassion to help and bring hope to the helpless. And that's what we're called to do. Why not take an opportunity at Christmas to throw an event that probably cost us, I have yet to figure it out. I kind of don't want to look at the bills anymore. I guarantee it probably cost us about 15 grand as a church to support this thing fully. Why would we do that? Compassion. Because we know that God's blessed us so much, it's not for us. What else are we going to do? I think if you hear anything this morning, please hear. There's no shoulds in this. I don't even, in the parable, I didn't even hear a should or an ought. He gave the story to, to exemplify the life that he lived and said, look, there's just going to be a time when you're held accountable. And I want you to be a part of the sheep. I want you to be a part of those people who live like me, who follow what I did. And trust me, when they did this and did this and did this and did this, it was like they were doing it to me. I do not want you to be in the other section of those who refuse to help. Why? Because you were stuck in judgment. You were caught up in your own apathy and your own junk. And therefore, compassion could not move you to bring hope to those who need help. Only compassion can be your fuel. So let's pray. That's what hope would do for us. Let's pray together. God, I pray this morning that even now with a message like this, that you would just clear out any of the cobwebs from my lack of being able to communicate it or thoughts that just enter our mind as we sit for a while and listen. But God, I hope that it would be clear from your word and from your life that your compassion moved you to point others to you, to the absolute hope that we can have in you. And those who have need, those in distress, those who are helpless and feel helpless, God, we are called to do the same. God, would you do nothing but move our hearts to a place of compassion and then just take it from there. Let us naturally flow out with gratitude and generosity how you've called us to live. We thank you so much that you are the hope of the world and we continue to point people to you. In your name, Jesus.